Thanks so much. Really glad to have the chance to join everyone here today. So as um, was just said, I'm going to be talking about effective communication in Japan. I think that there's really a triple whammy for those people who are trying to communicate effectively with Japanese colleagues. And so one aspect of that is that Japanese communication tends to be in general less direct than that in many other countries. Also, um, Japanese communication tends to rely less on words. And then we have the thing that people tend to think of most when they think of these challenges, and that is the um, language barrier, which seems very obvious, but when you put the language barrier together with the cultural challenges, that's where you get a lot of, um, a lot of um, difficulties there. I call it the triple whammy because, you know, there's three parts, but they tend to reinforce each other and make things really difficult. But I think it's important to kind of take these apart and look at it one by one. And I'm going to be talking about sort of where these differences come from, but also for people who are interacting with Japanese, what you can do about that to be as effective as possible in your communication. So what I'm going to do for the first two factors are cultural factors. And there's a tool that we use in the cross-cultural field called cultural dimensions, where we put different um, aspects of culture on opposite ends of the scale. And so those things on each end are going to be opposite of each other. And then we show where different cultures might be along those scales. Now, for every position for a culture, there's really a bell curve. There's a range of differences. Not everyone in a given culture is going to be exactly the same. But it gives us an idea, kind of puts us in the ballpark, shows us where some of those tendencies are. So let's take a look at the first one. So this is a, a communication and conflict resolution style scale. And cultures that are on the left-hand side of the scale like to be really frank and really direct. They say exactly what they think, just what's on their minds. They don't miss words, mince words. They don't beat around the bush. And um, they tell it like it is. And all those expressions we have in English are um, you know, about being rather direct in your communication. Um, whereas on the other hand, cultures on the right-hand side of the scale are very concerned with saving face, both for oneself and for others. And so cultures on the right-hand side tend to not want to communicate directly. They'll use um, more roundabout ways of saying things, or they'll kind of drop hints or in many cases, actually not say anything at all. So the absence of saying something speaks um, very loud in those cultures. So interestingly here, you know, we tend to think of Japan as a rather indirect communication culture. It's not all the way out the right-hand side of the scale. There are some cultures that are even more indirect than Japan. So how you feel about Japanese indirectness is gonna um, matter what culture you're coming from, from your own culture. But for a lot of Western cultures tend to be to the left of Japan on this scale. So for those people um, coming to Japan from um, Western cultures, Japanese are gonna be fairly indirect. So how does this affect your day-to-day -day communication? There's really two main things. If you were on the left-hand side of the scale, you need to be a really good listener to understand some of those indirect messages that Japanese may be giving you. So for example, rather than say, oh, that's a terrible idea, I hate it, Japanese will often tend to say something like, well, that may be difficult, or I'd like to think about that, or we're going to consider that. Um, which are generally signals that people are not very happy, but taken on the face of it, could sound like, okay, you're going to think about it. So I am guess I'm going to hear back from you soon. Or, oh, it's difficult, but we can try hard and we can really make it work. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard stories of people from other countries who were told, it's going to be difficult by a Japanese colleague and thought, oh, that means I have to put more energy into it. And so they start doubling down. Meanwhile, their Japanese colleague is thinking, did they not get my message? Why are they doing this? And then the, the non-Japanese person 
doing something and they're not getting any, any good um, traction from it and be, everyone gets frustrated. So it's very easy to have miscommunications around this. So it means if you're from a culture on the left-hand side, you need to pick up on subtle hints and to be um, proactively doing that much more than you would in your own culture. Because if you're from a culture on the left, you're kind of used to people beating you over the head with information and making it really, really clear. And that's not gonna happen with cultures on the right. The other thing that you need to be careful of if you're from a culture that's to the left of Japan is that you can um, very easily overwhelm people on the right-hand side of the scale, and in fact, even shut down their communication. And the way that people on the left do that is by being very direct themselves. So if you're saying, well, I think this, or we ought to do that, and you put your opinion out there very strongly, that can make it very hard for Japanese to be saying anything different. So let's take a um, non-Japanese manager who has a Japanese team and says to the team, well, you know, we need to decide between A and B. I really think we should do A. What do all you think? And for a Japanese team, it's going to be very, very hard to say, oh, well, actually, B is better. Right? There's a feeling of it's rude to disagree with people, particularly those who are higher than you in the hierarchy. So you can really shut down a lot of information. Much, much better to say, hey, we need to choose between A and B. What do you guys think? Right? And so leaving it to the other side to share what they think. Also, I kind of pose this as a manager talking with a team, but actually another thing with people on the right-hand side of the scale is they often don't feel comfortable giving their opinion in a group setting. And so then you'll get the situation of, so what do you guys think? And there's no sound whatsoever in the meeting, no response. And so a lot of times when you're working with people on the right-hand side of the scale, it's much better to have a one-on-one -on -one communication with them. So to sum up, you need to listen more carefully and you need to be aware of how the way you're speaking may be shutting people down and not giving them a chance to really share their opinion because they feel like they don't want to disagree with you. Now, a second factor that interacts with this is that in Japanese culture, people are, are much less reliant on words for their communication. And on this scale, we actually see Japan is all the way on the right-hand side. And this ability or preference for communicating without words is part of what gives us some of the things that we like best about Japanese culture. And so those would include, for example, emoji or manga, or if you're in the um, industrial field, kanban. Um, because that's a way of visually showing things and communicating a lot without a lot of words. Um, if we go back further in history, haiku would be a good example. Uh, Japan also created the um, sort of um, pictographs that are used for signage, like your, your person leaving an exit sign, things like that. Those were created for the 1964 Olympics. And so how can we communicate using pictures? Um, that was another example. So there's a lot of these examples where Japan's preference or ability to communicate in visual or nonverbal ways has really contributed to our global culture. On the other hand, when it comes to business conversations, the fact that Japanese don't always put things in words can be very challenging for people from other countries. And the farther that your country is on the left on this scale, the more that that is going to be a challenge for you, right? So in the Japanese culture, it, there's a traditional phrase, hear one, understand 10. The idea is, is that if someone gives you 10% of the information, if you are a good listener, you can piece that together and figure out yourself what the other nine are. For people on the far left of this scale, we're used to getting all 10, all spelled out, 
handed to us on a silver platter. And in some cases, if you're talking with, for example, with an attorney, they might give you 11 or 12 or 15 or something like that. Um, you know, so the idea of putting things specifically in words is a big part of business culture um, in, in cultures, particularly on the left-hand side of the scale. And on cultures on the left-hand side of the scale, people are trained to do that. So I'm from the United States and a large part of my elementary, junior high school and high school education was all about honing the ability to express yourself either verbally or in writing. And so there were classroom debates. And you started when you're in kindergarten, you had show and tell. And um, most of junior high, I, I remember writing paragraphs, which were all persuasive, topic sentence, supporting reasons, conclusions, et cetera. And so it's very common in the United States, for example, to, to ask someone, so what do you think? And people are expected to be able to immediately or have an answer that they verbalize. That's not something that happens so much in Japanese culture. And I've had many Japanese tell me, they're asked suddenly, what do you think? And they, you know, they're, they're, they hadn't prepared and, it, and it's not something they're used to spitting out an opinion so quickly. Um, in some ways that may be a good thing. Um, typically in Japan, people are encouraged to think through very carefully what they want to say before they do put it in words. And the volume of words tends to be less. So I had a situation a couple of years ago, I was um, leading a team building for an American firm's operation in Japan um, that was being conducted in English, but the, um, the participants were both um, Americans and Japanese. And I noticed something very interesting that the American CEO was talking a lot like you would expect might happen in a um, team building situation but the Japanese COO was not saying very much. And immediately in very kind of American fashion in my mind, I thought, oh, he's not talking very much. Maybe he's not happy with what's going on, or maybe I've got a problem here. Because in cultures on the left, the more you talk, the better, and people who don't talk very much might be unhappy or there might be a problem. So I started kind of observing the COO. And indeed, he hardly ever said anything. However, whenever he said something, it was brilliant. It was perfectly timed. It was just the comment that was needed to move the situation forward or the discussion forward at that point. And it wasn't very long, but it was always completely on target. And so you really wanted to pay attention whenever he said something because it was going to be really worthwhile and valuable. So he maybe talked five or six times throughout the whole two day session. Every time he said something, it was perfect. So that would be more of a communication style that might be valued in Japanese culture where you don't say very much, but when you say something, it has a lot of, um, you know, it's very dense, right? So the thing, if you're in cultures on the left-hand side, you've got two challenges. And one again is picking up on some of the things that aren't said, reading between the lines, filling in the other nine when you've got one. And that requires paying attention, putting together the pieces, and also asking follow-up questions. Because if there's something that you didn't catch, you need to find a way to get that information. And often if you're asked a skillful question, you can draw out more. But if you don't ask a question, a Japanese person may assume that, that you completely understood what was going on and need to know what to do. So many times when I see non-Japanese, and this is, has happened to me too may, so many times, so many times I see people making mistakes or having problems in their communications with Japanese, it's because they took something that was a vague statement or instruction and they didn't ask for clarification or more information and then just made an assumption about what it meant and made the wrong assumption. It's very easy to do if someone only gives you 10% to think, oh, okay, I figured it out. But if you don't confirm that, you actually could be completely on the wrong track. I know I've done that way too many times. So asking those clarifying questions, it's very important. The other thing that's very important if you're on the left-hand side of the scale 
is basically shut up once in a while. Um, people on the left-hand side of the scale love to talk. We love to hear ourselves speak. And we're used to spewing out lots of words because as I said, that's what our education system tends to prepare us for. That is completely overwhelming to people on the right-hand side of the scale. And if you talk less and listen more, you're gonna get a lot more information because that will make um, Japanese feel like they have more room to speak. Um, and also, if you talk too much, it becomes too much for people to process because if they're not using to, used to getting that many words, right? And that dovetails with our third factor, which is the language barrier, right? So there's, it's obvious for those of us who don't speak Japanese, it's not easy to use Japanese. It's not easy to learn Japanese. It's not easy to work in Japanese. Um, Japanese is one of the most difficult languages for speakers of English to learn. Um, you see, see rankings of how many years it takes to become proficient that um, Japanese is going to be at the top of the list. However, what's really important to remember is that also it flips the other way. So for Japanese, when they are using English, it's just as important. I mean, sorry, it's just as difficult. Um, so the challenges for non-Japanese and learning Japanese, it's gonna be very difficult because it's just the reverse thing for Japanese using English. And so if you are a verbal person and you're talking too much, you are just gonna be overwhelming someone who um, doesn't have a lot of confidence in their listening comprehension and not giving them enough time to formulate what they wanna say. So it's very important um, if you are a native speaker of English or a proficient speaker of English working with Japanese is to be modulating your English use. That means slowing down, using less complicated grammar, using less slang and jargon, enunciating clearly, and then stopping and giving people time to process and time to respond. So being aware of your own language use and adjusting it is very, very important. And then realizing that for Japanese, that even someone who you're speaking with them and their English sounds great, it may not be that easy for them to be catching everything that you're saying. And so I think it's easy for us to um, kind of get into this mode where we just kind of go back to speaking at, at, at native speaker speed and, and we lose people. So I think you know, being aware is important. So those are some things to think about. I'm going to finish up here. And um, just whenever you can be aware of all these factors um, and make, make some adjustments, it's gonna be helpful for you. Thanks.